There's a universe inside each of us. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the One Within All to Innerverse. I'm your host, Chance, and I'm supremely pleased that you're tuning in for another exploration of powerful ideas that can enhance your energy, inspire you creatively, and unlock the next level of your spiritual journey in this physical world. I'm grateful we're able to connect across time and space with the magic of the internet, and thanks to this amazing technological age we're in, our potential for knowledge is no longer limited by long distance or cultural barriers. And the opportunity to avail ourselves of ancient wisdom to accelerate our accumulation of truth is something we really ought to use to our advantage. On this episode, we're going to be accessing the ancient science of Ayurveda and learning more about the alchemical Vedic lineage from one of the brightest pioneers in the field, a highly sought after speaker, teacher and spiritual leader named Acharya Shunya. After becoming the first female leader of her Vedic lineage at the young age of 24, Shunya has dedicated herself to spreading the philosophy of non-dualism to a Western audience, changing lives, activating awakenings, and empowering students to realize their infinite potential. Her book, Ayurveda Lifestyle Wisdom, has been translated into seven languages. She's given countless talks for organizations around the world. She's an advisor to the Indian government on spiritual matters, and she's developed an online course series covering a myriad of magical modalities for healing and expanding your consciousness which you can find at vedicaglobal.org. It may sound like Shunya does a lot of stuff, but to be honest, I've barely scratched the surface of describing her prolific, passionate, and powerful presence as a leader of her lineage. When it comes to embodying our highest selves and improving our lives, I think there's something valuable to seek in almost all spiritual traditions of the world. And with Shunya's non-dual teachings, her goal is to assist and uplift humanity on a universal level. And so regardless of your beliefs or backgrounds, There's something for everyone to gather from Vedic wisdom and room for all of us to explore it. I expect to learn a lot of ways to better love myself from this conversation, and I hope you can pick up some puzzle pieces to match with your own by joining us. You can find links to the courses at Vedica Global, Shunya's website, and the things we're going to talk about in this episode by checking the show notes for this podcast. And while you're there, you'll find the link to subscribe to Interverse Plus and access the second hour extension of this chat. And by becoming a member, You'll unlock the plethora of plus exclusive content that we've been building week by week for a very long time. To my plus members, you have my heartfelt thanks and gratitude for supporting one of your favorite shows. And of course, I greatly appreciate our free audience too, but y'all are missing out on some good stuff if you ask me. And for those of you who are new to the show, make sure you're subscribed on your favorite podcast playing app so you can explore all the past and future consciousness creating content we've got. Now it's time to open up those third ears and eyes, fire up that beacon of light within, and absorb as much ancient and modern wisdom as we can eat with the spiritually fulfilling teachings of our honorable guest, the global guru of the mind, body, and spirit, and purveyor of powerfully purifying positive teachings, the extraordinary Acharya Shunya. Thanks so much for joining us, and welcome to Interverse. Thank you so much, Chance, and thank you for such a beautiful introduction. I feel very elevated. Thank you. <laughs> very good. That is the goal. I like to kick things off with a reminder that the reason that we're all here seeking this type of knowledge is to better love ourselves and to explore the infinite consciousness potential within each of us. But I'm really excited to dive into the Vedic sciences. So Could you give us an introduction to what Vedic sciences are and Ayurveda as a path? There is an era from ancient India known as the Vedic era. And this is so long time ago, like a couple of thousand years ago. And a couple of thousand years ago, India was not raw and trying to find itself. Clearly, it had found itself. It's more like it has lost itself now. But the Vedic era was an era of enlightenment and higher consciousness. And at that time, men as well as women, both contributed to a lot of universal wisdom known as the Vedic wisdom, which was much, it was oral in the beginning, you know, passed from teacher to master to student. 
And but then gradually it became compiled in four great books of wisdom known as the Vedas. And I love it that it's not a you know a male-driven patriarchal piece of wisdom but it's really men and women who've gone beyond their sexual orientation, beyond their body limitation, and have harnessed a deeper mind, a higher mind, a pure mind, and an interconnected mind, you know, the multiverse, the whole, the evolution of our consciousness and how it can come forth as really beautiful wisdom. That is what Veda is about. And this, this Veda gave us yoga, it gave us meditation, And it gave us so many more teachings, including its beautiful holistic medicine known as Ayurveda. So Veda literally chants comes from the root word vid. In Sanskrit, vid, V-I-D, means to know. When there was a desire to know, there was a revelation in pure mind that was beyond boundaries. And that was eternal, not, you know, something that's very you know, this worldly and small and petty, it was really going to be relevant in the past, present, and the future. And that is what the Veda is. That does sound like a pretty good summary. And I find it really interesting that, like you said, it's surpassing the limitations of time. But when we do think about how long ago this system must have originated from, it makes me think that civilization was much further advanced than we typically give our ancestors credit for. Do you think that this wisdom tradition points at a more holistically empowered and wise and knowledgeable civilization of the past that we may have just kind of forgotten about? I mean, looking at the Eurocentric, the more European historic timeline that we all study at school, and I don't think it matches up with the real picture of the world civilizations. And I do believe that civilizations rise and they fall. And this is not a sequential order in which humanity has been evolving from the Stone Age up till now, the computer age. I think uh, humanity has reached peaks of its civilizational glory many times. And um, the Vedas come from that time. And you would be surprised, Chance, because I was, because I have studied all modern you know, knowledge systems, language, trigonometry, a lot, you know, algebra, geography, politics. And then I've studied the Vedas. And I realized, oh my God, there was so much that was known to ancient men and women in the Indian subcontinent because Veda was not limited just to the present day India, but was spread over many countries in Southeast Asia, this culture that has given birth to the Vedas. There was so much uh, science and technology, the knowledge of the law of gravity, the knowledge of blood circulation, thousands of years before Harvey discovered it, the discussion of a, a Sanskrit word called gravity, but in Sanskrit it is called Guru Tattva Siddhanta, which means that which is heavy pulls everything towards itself. So probably I'm not just clapping my hands for Indians. I, if I go to Egypt, if I go to, you know, the... Um, the original Native American culture, if I go to China, if I look at Tibet, if I look at the deep, deep traditions, there's so much knowledge that our ancestors have been holding. And I'm proud to be an ambassador of one such system. That's awesome. I am familiar with the concept of like the yugas that we've had a rise and a fall. And I'm also very impressed with the well-rounded level of knowledge you're describing that you can actually see parallels with all these different wisdom traditions in the truths that you find in the Vedic system. One thing that I think is kind of harmful, actually, to be honest, I think it's a lot harmful of our modern time is the worldview that's created by a pure scientific materialism and the sort of description of the universe as being this infinite, mostly empty, gigantic space where Humanity is just a dot on a dot on a dot and kind of insignificant. You know, that worldview really separates us from spirit in many ways. It separates us from deeper purpose. It separates us from many things that our ancestors took for granted as being why they're here or how they're here. I was wondering what the Vedic description of the universe entails, of what the universe is. 
Uh, what a great question to start with. Actually, the later part of the Vedas are known as Upanishads or Vedanta. Vedanta literally means the last part of the Vedas. And that's a very deeply philosophical you know, section. But interestingly, many quantum physicists and Nobel laureates have gone to the Upanishads and pulled out things like string theory, collapsing and rising universes, and all those kind of very, very cutting edge quantum physics declarations have been found to be in the Vedas in the later part of it known as Vedanta. And according to Vedanta or the Vedas, but their later part, the universe exists and doesn't exist at the same time. It's like a particle in a wave and it cannot exist without the subject. And we are that eternal subject. And so when we're not looking at a particle, it's a particle. I mean, when we look at it, it becomes a wave. In the same way, when we have a certain consciousness, we manifest the whole universe. And then when we, uh, when we become part of the universal consciousness, we go beyond this universe. We go into the pure subject. There is no longer an object to view. Then we realize that this was really only not a hallucination, but it was definitely something just like we wake up and create a world in the waking world. Then we create multiple worlds in our dream world. There is another world to wake up to, which is beyond all these worlds. And that is the world of pure consciousness, pure awareness, pure subject. And at the subject level chance, there is no difference between you and I. The same subject has different units called the mind to perceive different versions of the same dream reality. But really, it's if we went deeper and deeper and deeper, I would find you and I are just different versions of looking at, observing that same thing. But the observer, which we call in the capital as self, is the one. So there are different bodies, different minds. There is really one self. And there's so many, you know, strange, unique, but actually quantum physics is now talking about it, that, you know, this universe is, um, is, is being born every time the subject looks at it. <laughs> so is this getting too much out there? But from the way you asked me this question, I felt you're already there. <laughs> yes, actually, I've come to experience this on a knowing level in my life, and I imagine that whenever you talk about self-realization as a part of the teaching path that you're on, that that's what you're describing, that it's not just a, a theoretical idea that on the highest level of ourselves, it's pure subjectivity and one single unified consciousness, but that you can actually help people to realize that from within themselves and know it. Yeah, there is no creator as such, or even, so that's like says, wow, that's so evolved, there's no creator. But then it goes, well, there's nothing created too. It's like, say it was really dark, and we saw a rope in the dark, and we thought, oh, it's a snake. And that imagined snake, which is all in the mind, can help us, you know, have a heart attack, a panic attack, sweat, you know, and really like, you know, muscle cramps. But when we look at it with the light aid of a lamp, we realize there was, there was no snake. There was only a rope. In the same way, the Vedanta says, or the Vedas say, when you look closely, there is no world. There is only pure consciousness. But it, it becomes different things to different, different minds through the different observation. So you and I could be looking at the same world and having a whole different world, like mini world in one experience. I, I think it's fascinating. It's really, this is where I, my, this is where I, as someone who was querying about the world, became really immersed and caught up in this deeper teachings. And I thought, oh my God, you know, and then they are nice, kind enough to say, you know, you can think of a creator if you're theistic minded, because after all, there is something beyond you at this moment. There is something that is existing. And until you find that you are the creator of that existence, you can kind of outsource it to God. But you shall in due course, if you keep meditating, contemplating, find that you are the 
karta, the doer, you are the dharta, the maintainer, and you are the destructor of, of your own universe. You are the harta. You are it. And it's very evolved philosophy. Sometimes it can, if it's wrongly understood, it can lead to, a, you know, God complex or narcissism. That is a really good point, actually. It's something that even if you don't intend to fall into, you can kind of, st it can still happen. Like even if you don't go about trying to sort of dominate others with your will in a, in a God complex, you can still sort of freak yourself out by trying to assign yourself too much responsibility, assign the unit that you currently are experiencing too much responsibility for the shared consensual external reality that we're all in. <laughs> so that like, that's something that I, I've experienced before. I, it's hard to describe, but it's uh it can give you a very uncomfortable feeling if you're putting too much weight on that realization instead of just sort of living your life in the way that is best for you to attain that state. It actually can separate you from the, the knowing state to be in a state of belief that I, I control everything like the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, that is why this knowledge, especially from the later section of the Vedas known as Vedanta, was considered um, qualified knowledge. And really what even what we're talking about is just, you know, superficial tip of the iceberg. But it was very, uh, it was conveyed after due what is known as, in Sanskrit, it is known as adhikari. Like your mind has to be an adhikari or qualified to receive this knowledge. You have to be willing to understand that why the Upanishads are proposing or the Vedanta is proposing that this universe is neither created by a super being nor, ma nor manifested from matter coalescing after the Big Bang, but rather it suddenly springs into manifestation by your act of seeing. It's an instant creation. It's a moment-to-moment -moment creation. But for a lot of people participating in this, they're like, this is cumbersome. I can't believe this. This world is so objective. I can touch it, smell it, feel it. It has to come from something physical and it has to have a creator. And they can't deal with it because they're so, you know, gross-minded. And they want a sequential order of things, a sequential seeing, which is known as krama drishti. But the Vedanta says that things can instantly spring into manifestation, just like you can instantly think of a, you know, a bag of Cheetos in your mind. You can think it. You can even feel it. Your saliva can go if you're into fast food. Or you can instantly think of, you know, somebody beloved to you and your sexual fluids can get flowing. So it's like that. It's an instant creation. And you are the creator of that. And everybody's individual creations become the macro creation, but you're very much creating what is known as a yuga patrishti or a, it is not a, it is not a slow process of trans transformation, but immediate. And so you change your thoughts, your creation changes. You change your beliefs, your, your universe changes. You change one idea, your universe changes. And that's why you and I are in business, right? We believe in this. We believe that we are the creators, but so many people get disoriented. And so I would, I don't know how many people would start listening to this and then we'd lose them. But there'll be some people who are like, oh my God, I want to listen to this show. I want to listen to it again and again. They are clearly ready, according to Vedas, not just over one lifetime of inquiry, but several lifetimes of inquiry where a human being is now no longer happy to be like, a content animal being fed and procreating and sleeping in the sun. It wants to know who am I and what's my relationship with this universe? And am I uh, a mere participator or am I a scriptwriter, director, and, you know, the person who takes a curtain call? Who am I? And that's so fascinating. I think so, too. I have a question about the history of the tradition being orally transmitted do you think that over the course of the last century, something pure is lost both in this tradition and in, in many other mystery school traditions just by putting things down to a text and then referring to a text and trying to interpret that? 
like, cause I know that initiation into this wisdom, like you said, it was exclusive knowledge, the, the later part of the Vedanta. Do you think that those initiation practices and the fact that it was only transmitted orally helped people to not get lost in the, uh, the higher reaches? Do you think that's an important element that was lost? Or do you think we're now having come through that time of referring to text and now being able to talk about things openly with anyone in the world like we can? Is this the age of self-initiation? You're really opening amazing questions. I do think that the purity and the intent of the Veda is lost. I'm, I will absolutely agree, as with many traditions, with the wear and tear of time, but also because when when the things were oral, it required that an incumbent student needed a teacher, a mentor, and then that mentor needed a student. So it so in our tradition, it goes back all the way to Brahma, where is to the highest consciousness from godly consciousness, which came down to rishis of the seers, which then went on to like noble human beings who were dharmic. And so they got that knowledge. But then once it got written down, and now you can order the Vedas on Amazon, for example, you know, people started self-analyzing it. And a lot of words don't mean what it's written. For example, Krishna in Bhagavad Gita, or Ma, it's one of our scriptures, is supposed to be when he plays the flute. And the go, go means the cow, and cow in Sanskrit is go, come to him, they follow him. And so people literally interpreted, you know, Krishna as a as a as a herdsman. And you know, they you see popular pictures of Krishna with a lot of cows and all that's fine, you know, no problem with that. Except that it's a real trivialization of what was really being said, because go also means your sensory organs. And when Krishna plays the flute, which is the higher consciousness, the higher will, then the senses follow that. So the teaching was really that you're the master of your senses. You can play the music you want and the senses will follow you. They should follow the soul. But it all got about, you know, we have beautiful enchanting stories of Krishna and the cows and which is all fine, but then gradually the current version of Vedic understanding in, in, in its original country, India also, has been reduced to a lot of stories and they're all uplifting stories. Please understand, I'm not criticizing it, but I'm also lamenting what is lost, which was the, which was the higher, the possibility for a collective evolution of our consciousness and to, to really understand the ultimate teaching that Vedanta gives, which is known as Vivartavad, or the theory of appearances, that we witness a causation, but there is no creation in it, there is no transformation in it. What it really means is that mm, new things appear different without ceasing to be who they are. So it, when our mind is polluted and agitated, we see the whole world as cunning and nasty. When our mind is pure, we see the world as beautiful, full of spring and sunshine and innocence. So we are, every. if you bring down, 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 ad infinitum, you bring down all the waves, there is nothing but an ocean. You take all the clay pots, you reduce it to pure clay, there is nothing. In the same way, you take the whole universe and you reduce it to nothing but pure consciousness. These deeper teachings are forgotten. You ask any average Indian, even the religious, spiritual kind, they'll be quickly telling you a mantra, a chant, you know, let's please this God and here, hold a breath and do this and that. I personally feel these are all great, but they almost distract you from a deeper conversation. Somehow you were not born in India, but you seem to be having this deeper conversation ongoing with yourself, with other guests, now with me. So... I feel now, so answering your second question, we cannot initiate people because we can't go back to the old way. And we definitely cannot keep it limited within the boundaries of India. I think Veda is reviving again because true knowledge never dies. Actually, it never died. It's not, I don't have to revive it. It's still living amongst very highly conscious creme de la creme kind of spiritual, non eclectic non, you know, bound in religions, going beyond even the human 
uh, loyalty to understand consciousness and spirit at a very radical level. Veda is still informing those circles and Veda is finding people who think in that way, whether they may have studied Sanskrit or not. Because I think anyone who wants to know the higher questions is a Vedic seeker, you know, wants to know. So in this new world, I'm trying not to criticize anything, but I'm definitely trying to open deeper conversations. And my heart goes out to you for being so young in your body. I mean, you're definitely a young man, but you're an old soul. And so as a Vedic teacher, I can see this is not your first lifetime dwelling into this. And it's clearly, that's why you're even hosting the show and doing what you do, because you want to be one of those people like me who want to elevate the conversation humanity is having amongst itself. And that is what the Vedas were doing, inviting us to question, who am I? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Beautifully said. And yeah, that's the reason why I do this, what I'm doing here is because I don't think you can ever run out of ways to say that the source of things is worth looking at or questioning. You know, the question is the answer for me. Continue asking the question and you'll be shown in infinite ways, the truth in different ways. And I think that's one of the advantages of having things in text form is you do get to see how subjectivity plays into interpret like how you interpret something that, like you said, Krishna, the cow herding also meant the fo following the sense or the senses following the music, if you will. I didn't know that, but from my background or upbringing in the, uh, you know, standard American Christian religious system, I took all those kind of teachings as face value as well. And when I started exploring, when I let go of the dogma and started exploring more deeply, I came to learn that a lot of what was being said in the New Testament stories, and even in the Old Testament for that matter, was actually referring to astrological correlations that, or astrotheology is the word for it. Jesus' 12 disciples, for example, can represent the Zodiac. And the whole scripture in the Western tradition is actually one big metaphor for multiple things, not really for, you know, for the initiated, it definitely doesn't mean the most basic way you could read it or the literal interpretation. And I think that really what we experience all around us does the same thing. But I was wondering if, you know, in the, the Vedas and the Bhagavad Gita, are there references or connections to astrology or to interpreting the current, setting of the energies of the physical world through looking at the external world and the way that things are, are symbolically arrayed? Because we all have one common reality, which is pure consciousness of living and non-living. So therefore, the basic premise is that everything is affecting everything. So to think that these huge heavenly bodies are not influencing us and our minds would be, you know, it's, we can do that. But Vedas from the beginning gave a emphasis upon astrology and a whole, like Vedic medicine is known as Ayurveda, Vedic astrology is known as Jyotisha, which literally means the, the third eye that can look beyond. And so throughout the Vedas, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, uh, you know, Krishna stories in Bhagavad Purana, Ayurveda text, medical text, talk about Jyotish and astrology. So we it's it's interwoven with us, but unfortunately, and by the way, I'm really fascinated to hear what you have to present, and I hope you have some paper or show in which I can hear more. I When I look at some of the Christian teachings, when I look at the mystical Christian teachings, I, I always have felt that there is some Vedanta being taught here, some deeper teachings. But again, you know, you can take a great science and you can interpret it in a very here and now. And this God belongs to this set of people who look like this, talk like this. You know, we can go there. We can have that syndrome of taking a universal existence into a very phenomenal here and now belongs to me existence. So I'm not at all surprised if you found 
these connections in Christianity, and I would be loving to, I would love to know more. And similarly, so what is astrology then? Because here we are talking about a universe that exists and doesn't exist. But then this is the beauty, this is something you would love to hear about that Vedanta is so astute. It says that, well, there are three kinds of reality. There is one reality that each one of us creating in our own mind. And, you know, when we daydream, when we think, when we have our own subjective universes, like outside, they might be a party and inside we might be thinking of committing suicide. So there's clearly a disparity. So we have two universes. So one is your private universe. So that is known as a, we have a Harika reality. Then there is a transactional reality in which you and I are talking. And this transactional reality is like our, a collective, uh, it's like a salad bowl of everybody's minds interweaving with each other. And at this level, even the heavenly bodies and the planets and the 12 planets, they're all influencing us. We're all into each other's sphere, so to say. And uh, we cannot remove one thing out of this transactional reality. We can't really remove one little atom and throw it away because there is no this and that. In this transactional reality lives this physical, uh, so to say, manifested universe. And here astrology matters. Here medicine matters. Here science of relationships matter. Here economics matter. But there is a third reality which opens up to select few who live in the transactional reality, but don't take it as the ultimate reality. And then they start meditating and going within, like the Buddha, for example, or the Jesus, you know, or Shankaracharya, or these deeper teachers. And they went in and they in, and they were their body remained in the transactional world, or known as the Vyavaharika reality, but they had already, their mind had gone into the absolute reality where neither astrology mattered, nothing mattered. Um, medicine didn't, wasn't needed. It was the pure Jesus space. It was the pure Krishna space, for lack of better words, because words cannot describe that reality. Only seers have seen it and told us that we all experience it occasionally when we are you know, deep inside us. Only some of us, most of us lead superficial lives. So they did not... They did not, the Vedas did not minimize the need for medicine or religion or sex or astrology. In fact, they uplifted it. And amongst them, but they put astrology at a very high pedestal because it guides our soul to not stay stuck. Because if we don't raise our awareness, we'll keep coming back into this middle level and keep being born again and again and think I'm a banker. I'm a teacher, I'm an acharya, a master teacher, and have this ego around it and forget that I'm pure consciousness wearing a body and having a title. So I don't know if I stayed on your point or went off, but you're kind of creating that space where we can have a, where we can have a crazy slash normal conversation. <laughs> that is exactly the space I hope to create, definitely. And yeah, feel free, any any tangents you want to go down are going to be more than palatable for us. I promise this has been really great so far. And back to the astro theology elements of Christianity, or maybe the connections between Christianity and the, the ancient Vedas. First of all, I think an obvious one is that Christ and Krishna are pretty similar words overall. But then if you go back all the way to the old Testament, one of the most famous characters is Abraham or you could say a Brahmin, and his wife is Sarah, who could be Saraswati. So, I mean, that's just a few that are off the top of my head. I haven't covered it in depth, but there's a lot of researchers that have really drawn all these parallels and connections between those two systems and probably other religions as well. So it's pretty amazing. And I really liked your description of the three worlds that we can inhabit or experience. It reminds me of the... German mystical idealist philosophers and their idea of a tripart reality as well, where they had three sections called the Midwelt, the Eigenwelt, and the Umwelt, which we don't have words for this in English, but so I've adopted these German words being that they're extremely useful. The Midwelt is the world between people. It's the social world that we experience. It's all of our rules and customs and how all that's laid out. 
the umwelt is the world of nature. It's just what is. It's what it's the flow of everything that's happening. And the eigenwelt is your inner world or your I, yourself. So the three circles of these three spheres overlap with each other. And your reality is that middle point between midwelt, umwelt, and eigenwelt. So I think that looking at things in trinities is very useful. But while we're at this point of the show, I'd love to switch gears slightly and talk about the importance of medicine and Ayurveda and maybe talk about how, as a system, it incorporates spirit in a way that the West pretty much disregards. Oh, well, yeah. You know, because it is Vedic medicine, spirit is not just an adjunct or a by-the-way thing. Oh, yeah, mind, body, soul, you know, talking pretty. It's really there. I mean, in fact, it says that this science is for the spirit, which has incarnated and has a body and is, you know, traveling and is dealing with karma, which we can talk about more, but karma is some consequences from some good or bad actions in the past because of which we have health or ill health manifesting, you know, in the form of pain or joy because ill health gives us emotional and physical pain. So we are loaded with some things. There's the learning that has to happen. And so Ayurveda is going to be really helpful. So it's a very clear, you know, statement by in by the Ayurvedas that this is what Ayurveda is about. And even in the Ayurveda ancient texts from first century BCE that I teach to my students, fortunately they have survived. And I actually read from that and teach my students in our, my wisdom school, Vedika Global. So I have found that it gives so much ease and permission to us human beings to finally be not recognized merely as body and mind. And oh yeah, you have a spirit and you can take it to the priest or to the pundit based on what's your religion or, or you know, go sit and talk to a therapist if you're an atheist or agnostic. Here, it, it literally says, in, and I'm going to quote something in Sanskrit, the ancient language of the Vedas and Ayurveda, which says, Sharira Indriya Satvatma Samayogodhari Jivitam Nityagaschanu Bandhascha which means, oh my dear subject, you who is suffering, you are not just body, but you are body plus senses because your senses go out and interface with the world. And so you have to recognize them as an, a focal point of consciousness, not just the body. There's body, there is senses, and then there is mind, and then there is pure consciousness living with you. And while body, mind, and senses can be locales of suffering, the part that is still pure within you, consciousness, is devoid of any ill health. So this is so beautiful. So they say you, and life happens when all four come together. You can't just take body as life, senses as life, mind as life, unless and until consciousness is part of all of this and living it, because the life principle is consciousness. And good news, good news, says Ayurveda, consciousness is devoid of ill health. And I want to jump in and say it's really beautiful. At one point in one of the Ayurveda texts, they are describing different types of body, heterosexual, homosexual, hermaphrodite body. And they're saying, oh, yeah, this happens due to genetic changes. But the consciousness in all of them is devoid of abnormality and the same. So I really love how they talk about, oh, yeah, body, body sexual preferences and bodily changes in the genitals is due to genetics. But consciousness is the same and it is divine. That's what they say. So I love Ayurveda. In fact, I became a big promoter of it. I'm not a medical doctor. I am a, I am a spiritual teacher. But I started promoting Ayurveda and especially it's very spiritual, spiritually oriented lifestyle and food and some of the mindfulness that we can bring into daily life as we go about our life so that you can lead your life more as a fulfilled and self-fulfilling and self-soothing, self-healing spirit. And not just as this mind, you know, like, you know, running around like a chicken with a head cut off. Like, should I go to a chiropractor? Should I go to, a, you know, my MD? Should I go for surgery? And it's just going, you know, losing your sense of weight. Who am I? I'm this really amazing 
unfathomable, unexhaustible, limitless being in this limited body. So I can use Ayurveda to remind me of who I am. And then very simple things can help me. So, for example, I don't know if you notice this because you and I are talking on a video call and you and I can see each other, but I'm wearing some oil in my hair. And the reason for this is that my body, due to past karmas, or was born with a genetic condition known as ankylosing spondylitis. And when people hear the word spondylitis, they think, oh, it only affects the spine. But it's actually an immune system disorder and it affects each and every cell of the body, each and every joint, right down to the heart and the lungs and everything, you know, it's people with this condition are in wheelchairs or on steroids or on, uh, you know, or having multiple surgeries or depressed or locked away, you know, in their sorrow. I am walking around teaching healing through simple teachings of Ayurveda, such as when I put a certain oil on my body, um, the inflammation automatically comes down. When I think certain thoughts to myself, myself, which is, remember, consciousness is never unhealthy. It sends healthy thoughts to my whole being. And if my muscles are stiffening up, they calm down. They calm down. And that's why I have all my joints working, everything happening. There is some stiffness here and there, and but I tend to be able to recover. And just to wind up, because I'm getting a bit long here, I had an accident and my neck became stiff and it hasn't fully opened up yet. But I have not lost hope and nor am I ashamed to go out in the public world, on the stage. I'm on this world global arena, speaking, talking, talking to thousands at a certain time together. I never think I have a stiff neck because I don't think I am that stiff neck. I'm, I'm walking around with Ayurveda and the Vedas giving me permission that I'm pure consciousness. And I really believe it's a matter of time and my neck will be back. <laughs> I don't know if it's an empty hope, but it sure creates positive vibrations within my being. And I'm not depressed and I'm not ashamed. So I love this science. Thanks for asking about it. <laughs> well, thank you for that amazing explanation. And it definitely gave me a lot of stuff to think about. Well, first of all, I'd like to know a little more about the genetic condition. Is it something that you had from the beginning of your life and knew it pretty early on, or did it show up later? And I'm wanting to know more about how we can ourselves learn to see the karma connection to disease and how that could play into healing ourselves from our our unique problems. Yeah, thank you for that question, because, you know, anything I speak has to be Anything we speak here has to have connections in all of humanity listening to this, because they're all in the soup together of this transactional reality with, with you know, polarity, dark and light, good and bad, hot and cold, ill health and health. So when a young person starts demonstrating, you know, symptoms which come out of nowhere, because I was actually born in a Vedic lineage, as you mentioned in my introduction, and it was all about health. And everything was fine for me, but I started feeling some ache in my spine. It was after my mother passed away, and I was only 10 at that time. Due to her own congenital condition, she had a weak heart from birth, and it collapsed suddenly. And she just, you know, went to sleep. But the point is that after that, probably the, the internalized pain, or I don't know what happened, but... The pain kept continuing. And then for a while there, I was immobile. And I was a teenager at that time. And I went through a phase of, I don't want to have to deal with Ayurveda. I don't want to deal with the Vedas. Probably I had a lot of rage around losing my mother. And I had a rage around why my legs are not moving. Why every why it's even painful to breathe. Why it's difficult to even lift a cup. Because I had inflammation everywhere. So. That time, my teacher, Baba, my grandfather, one day I was crying in a pillow and he came to me and, and he said, what happened? And you know how impudent kids are at teenage age. And I looked at him and probably that was the only time I was kind of not that respectful of him in that moment. You know how kids are like, you don't understand my reality. So I felt like, can't you see I can't walk? And I don't know. 
somehow, sometimes when you're light and people look at you, they can take all your pain and your stupidness and they can hold it in a very safe and respectful place. And he did that. And then he said to me, yeah, I know you can't rock, but you can still fly. And I don't know what happened. It like, it's like he transmitted to me that I can create myself. I can create new wings of spirit and hope and courage and Ayurveda. And I had been listening to his teachings from childhood because he used to give public sermons. He'd teach private students in the morning and evening. His, you know, there'd be a satsang. When I heard that, I don't know, I became quiet. And afterwards, I, I allowed people to help me with Ayurveda, with oiling, with herbs, and uh, with the lifestyle changes. And I came out of it. And I never, ever, ever had that kind of a bad attack of pain and inflammation. Now it comes and goes. And when it comes and goes, I always look at what's going on. You know, what food am I not eating seasonally? Or what thoughts am I holding that I need to let go? So it's very, I have a new relationship with my own condition. It's become a teacher to me. If I'm in severe pain, that means I'm alienated from my pure spirit. And if I'm flowing like I am right now, I'm definitely in touch with it. Talk about karma. Ayurveda itself talks about astrology. Vedic astrology talks about how it traces karma and the condition I have of extreme pain known as Mahavata Vyadi in Sanskrit. I keep throwing those words, even though they are tongue twisters, but just bear with me. So these conditions are known as karmic. They were not brought on by me. I was not eating wrong foods. I was not, you know, leading a bad lifestyle. I had a beautiful lifestyle. But this came up and it was intertwined around sorrow and grief and some learning I had to do in coping with it. Probably I had given some others some sorrow and grief. But I can tell you that I'm a better human being, a better healer, a better teacher, and a better spiritual aspirant because of this pain. This pain made me humble. It brought me in touch with other people's pain. It made me realize that I'm not just my pain. It made me realize I'm more than my body. And I've come to the place where I can control a pain episode just with my mind. So I, it's been a whole big corridor of self-discovery. And then again, I go back to the Vedas, which says that this whole thing that's going on, this magic show, is not to hurt us, but for our own benefit. And we just have to have the eyes of wisdom to see it with new eyes. And we can blame it and blame it. And we can say, oh, bad karma, and I'm so unlucky. But maybe things revisit us so that we can come to whole new paradigm shifting conclusions. I have to write a book around this pain and my journey with it. And, and, and sometimes people want to know, so it's gone away. And so can you fix your neck completely? And I'm like, no, oh, please don't get, you don't get this. That the body will decay and there will be some physical suffering or there might be an occasional diarrhea or a cold. But the point is, are you suffering with it? I am not. And that's, that's where I rest my case. That is Vedanta. That is the Vedic medicine. And my pain index. Once I had gone to an MD, my husband said, we pay so much money for the medical insurance. We never go there. At least have a checkup. So I went to a rheumatologist. And I remember the rheumatologist saying, you, you, have, you have pain. You just don't acknowledge it. And I said, Maybe. I'm not numbing it. I can't be pretending to myself for 50 years of my life, 50 plus years. There might be physical pain, but there is a certain consciousness which is beyond it. And all the oiling and the right eating is, I'm having a blast chance. I'm not in a problem. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) I think your story really confirms for me some of my own kind of theory about pain which is that pain is oftentimes a rejection of our awareness of what is. I use this simple example all the time, but if I, in the past, I used to stub my toes a lot on chairs and things as I walked by them and I would just howl and jump up and down grabbing my foot. And since I gained a better body awareness through movement practices, it's not very common that I do that anymore. But now when I do, first I slow down immediately 
and think about what train of thought I was in or what, <laughs> what I was flowing through that led me to be unaware. And then as far as the pain part goes, I know that stubbing your toe is nothing like a chronic illness that causes inflammatory pain. But in the moment, something very sharp and painful that's just throbbing, if you take your awareness straight to the point of the pain and just focus in on that toe or whatever part of the body it is, the pain really transforms at that point and becomes more like information than like something that is so hot you can't touch it and that you want to just push aside. And I think that in your life, you it exemplify that medicine and supplements and things like that and oils, they're a symbol of your choice to embody your healthy, pure consciousness that primarily that's what they are. And I think that's why we see such a thing as the so-called placebo effect, which Western science has just labeled as if that explains it, but it's not <laughs> explained at all because it doesn't take in to account the the healthy, pure consciousness that we are as being capable of making whatever internal transformations that the medicine might represent. So I think that's really cool. That whole story is amazing. Yes. And yes. And the placebo effect is so like quickly dismissed, but it's like, wow, wow. <laughs> you know, the placebo effect has to be looked at us by us. And um, you're very right that the oiling that I do or the healthy foods I cook for myself and have, these are all ways to show love to my body and gratitude to have a body to, uh, to like frolic in while I don't really live in it. I'm having like an adventure through it, like the games my son plays on computer where he has created a virtual him while I, pure consciousness, is merely an observer. So I know that this body is really just... I'm also living through you. I'm also living through a caterpillar. I'm also living through a hummingbird. And I seem to have a lot of investment in this body called Acharya Shunya, who's like, you know, it's it's brown colored, Indian origin, and blah, 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 all those statistics. But actually, I really meditate and believe I live through everything. And then when this pain comes, I love the word you use. It's like information, because whatever you can observe, you are not that. You're not that I actually have a meditation and it's a free meditation we give away known as Atma Bodha meditation. I'd love to send you a copy, but it's an ancient Vedic meditation, which I have re-recorded, but it's really on if I observe my breath, I'm not the breath. It's back to I'm being a subject, right? So we are not only a subject of this world, but we are also the subject of the body. We're not the body. And that has really helped not only me, but my students when we look at the pain or we look at a pimple or we can even look at a cancer cell more as interesting information. And then remembering what is perennially healthy within you really is the place to stay at. Give it some love, give it some tender care, give it some, you know, presence, your own presence. Have the time that solves the problem. And if it doesn't, I don't know, we should do a podcast closer to my end of life, maybe. <laughs> I'd love to have you back several times. Yeah, I'd love to be back, especially on the day my life is ending and have a talk with you also. But probably I'll be fine observing the body fall away like a piece of clothing. I think so too. I mean, one of the first barriers that you cross over whenever you begin a meditation practice is being afraid of death. As soon as you can have just a few or maybe even one transcendental experience, you realize, oh, well, then that's just a journey. It's not an ending of who I am. But while we're still talking about Ayurveda a little bit, I was wondering if you could share any real life applications that listeners can take up on their own after this conversation. And as far as that meditation that you mentioned, I'd love to uh, link that in the show notes if you do share it with me. Absolutely. I'd love to give it away as a gift to all our listeners. And I think some of the things that people can do, I would, of course, welcome them to come study with me uh, in my not-for-profit wisdom school. We have put up a lot of education out there for the benefit of humanity, and it's as authentic as it can get. And as mainstream, and it's for everyday life for Americans, you don't have to go live in a temple or a, mo or a monastery to be, you know, to be benefiting from Ayurveda. But some of the real easy giveaways that I can give is one is 
try to align your life in this transactional real reality universe, the mid-level universe with two constants. One is sun and one is the moon. So try and wake up as early as possible with the sun. Try to eat when the sun is at its brightest. So have your biggest meal at noon, not at breakfast or dinner. And then as the moon, as the sun sets, try to eat before the sun sets and keep it the simplest one because the sun is setting. If you follow this, you will see just this one, you're, you're connected with the sun. Your physical body is nothing but the sun energy transformed into a body. You will have to agree. Sun is the primary source of energy. Then we get grass and plants and we get animals then we get humans. So top of the eco chain, but what you're really eating is sun transformed into different things. Another thing that if you are spiritually minded, you could walk out with the rising sun, you know, extend your hand, hold your heart and have this heart to heart connection with the sun and ask, ask for guidance to be rid of karma, to be shown the higher path, to know, to be given the Veda directly to you so that you can wake up from this dream of the dream of one lifetime story after another lifetime story, known as samsara in Buddhism and Hinduism, where we get caught up in. And uh, a lot of the times I might be aching or unsure of something. So when I go and stand there and I ask, and a few minutes later, you don't know this, but we can actually get free medicine from the cosmos. And Ayurveda encourages it. And I encourage it. Modern Ayurveda practices become all about herbs and clinical stuff and, you know, figuring out your energy imbalances. And then there's a lot of like a focus on disease. And my focus always is on health. And where can you get free medicine? And one of them is with the sun. And another way is with the moon. And every time you have a full moon, see if you can wear less clothes and meditate under it temperature, the weather permits, and all your emotions and, uh, you know, your problems and your angst, let it go in front of the full moon. The moon represents the mind, as you know, in astrology. Sun represents the soul in both Western and Eastern astrology, I assume. Correct me if I'm wrong. And so you can have this connection with the moon and uh, that will really help you. So try and sleep with the moon. So try and go to bed by 10 p.m. On every day, there can be occasional things, but if you're someone who wants to work with the rhythms of nature, then Mother Nature is our ultimate mother. See her signpost. She can't talk to you, but Ayurveda is her book. So these two things will really, really help you. A third one that's, you know, you can read my book, Ayurveda Lifestyle Wisdom, and I've given details on the kind of diet you should have, but there are seasons and then there are subtle, subtle seasons in between seasons where there are changes happening. If you can fall, if you cannot follow a store-bought diet or a magazine diet or a diet born from somebody's, you know, eureka moment, but eat what Mother Nature is trying to insist you eat. That's why she's putting all those things in front of you. Um, for example, pomegranates come up more around fall, late summer. They're really good to balance your own heat that's built up over the long, hot summer. So they're, so eating seasonally would be also a wise thing to do. Ayurveda has some superfoods like you must eat. You can benefit from eating aloe vera in fall or you can benefit from eating coconut cream in summer. And those details, of course, I can't give now, but you can definitely read my book. And hopefully that may be the only book you need because uh, it's the um, it's a bigger book, so take your time reading it. But it's it's complete. It it contains as much per thing as one needs to know in the public domain. It won't make you a doctor, but it will sure make you a happy camper on this planet in this dream. Awesome, that was a great answer, and I will have to pick up that book and make sure that I've gotten a good way through it before we talk again someday. I definitely plan on that. I'd love to do that. Well, I've got plenty more I could talk to you about, but we're definitely at the end of our time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being thank here with me. Thank you so much. And please let the good people know where they can find you online, how you'd like to connect with them and, in, you know, anything that they might need to take advantage of all the wonderful work you've been doing throughout your life. 
if you're attracted to what I'm teaching, come join my tribe. I do so many things. Uh, I don't even want to start a list, but yes, I teach the Vedas. I teach Ayurveda, the medicine, but the kind which will help you awaken to health. And I also teach yoga philosophy, the kind that will help you glide on those waves and use the wind to you know, keep moving forward. You don't have to jump from your jacket and fall to strange heights afterwards, rise and then fall crazily. So I teach all that. I'm very much a teacher of all the things we talked about. And I teach from passion, from my heart. You can always find me with the website that's mentioned in the show notes here at charishunya.com. You can make sure and get the spelling. I'm on all those regular social media handles. I have a whole team of volunteers and students who help me be present in the 21st century from a timeless space that I come from so that I can reach you in all the ways that you will be able to access me. And thank you, Chance, for having me. This has been awesome. Thanks, everybody, for listening. supreme beings and dharmic dreamers out there we have completed another episode and i loved it seriously acharya shunya was a big surprise came across my radar thanks to her own marketing agent or someone probably like that in her organization hit me up and let me know that she was looking to do a podcast interview with us and i was amazed 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 to see the depth of wisdom in her lineage how long and how far she's been building these ideas in the minds of uh, her followers or her students. And just all around, this was a crazy good episode. I loved that we started in the deep end and then kind of started exploring all the consequences of those deep realizations about the true nature of the higher self or the one self that I believe is the same self in all of us. And to me, it makes a lot of sense, because if you were to strip away all of the identity from yourself or from any other being, like take away the humanness, take away the name, take away the history, or for a cat, take away that they're a cat, (laughs) take away all the memory. The feeling of I am and isness is the same feeling for all living beings, no matter what they are. So... To me, that's pretty good evidence that the self is the exact same self. And it's just experiencing a bunch of different storylines, if you will, and identifying with them. But really, the isness of everything is the same and a singularity for all creation. That is what the singularity is. It's the self. What? Yep. Big surprise. Anyway, this was a great episode. I can't wait to have Shunya back for some future talks. I had so many more questions. Holy crap. So many more questions. Like, would really have enjoyed asking about the Vedic take on the afterlife, maybe. That would have been interesting. Also would have been fascinated to get more into the quantum physics ramifications of the Vedas and how or just where and what passages of scripture maybe some of these ideas that are now taken as scientific theory were pulled from the Vedas? I'd like to know more about that. Some of us maybe have heard about how at CERN, the big particle collider, they've got a Shiva statue, kind of a creepy one, and how Robert J. Oppenheimer, one of the architects of the nuclear bomb, when talking about the bomb or testing it, I'm not sure, but there's this famous recording of him saying out loud, I am become death, destroyer of worlds, which I'm pretty sure is a quote from the Vedas. And anyway, there's a train of thought that thinks that nuclear bombs as a concept came from studying the scriptures. So that that would be pretty interesting if that was true. Anyway, we had a wonderful time talking today. (laughs) I'm serious. Like, I wonder what I would have turned out like if I had an enlightened Vedic master for a grandfather. Maybe I wouldn't. Maybe I'd be a little more disciplined. Who knows? I had cool grandfathers and they had a lot going for them themselves. Like they could build cars and houses and stuff like that, which 
would have been good knowledge to inherit now in retrospect, but I didn't. Anyway, it sounds like Shunya was very positively influenced by hers. And I think that's a beautiful relationship to think about. I would have liked to get into more of her early life and what it was like going through her training. I mean, there's so much, so much more I could have talked to her about. So we will definitely have to do this again. And I'm glad she had fun. It was awesome. And if you are only hearing the free version of the show, I guess this would be a good time to tell you about all the cool, juicy stuff you missed out in on the Plus extension. If you haven't signed up for Interverse Plus, it's really easy to do. You go to patreon.com forward slash Interverse and pick the $5 option, the first option, plus. I mean, you could pick the higher tier options if you really wanted to. I wouldn't mind getting more of a donation from you, but I'm only asking for five bucks a month. Pretty low amount of money. It's like buying me a nice cup of coffee or something once a month in exchange. I do all these episodes and all this work. (laughs) I mean, the conversations with another person, it might not seem like a lot of work, but there's tons of preparation that goes in beforehand to make sure that I'm not just like going in completely unaware. And it's a lot of work to edit these things up to make it flow. You might not realize this, but these conversations are not just perfect back and forth, bam, 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 with no pauses or problems. That's actually not true. I mean, sometimes I have to get up and go to the bathroom. Sometimes I say, um, a bunch. And the same goes for the guest. There's some editing involved because I want it to flow nicely and be a really palatable chat for you guys. And that's just to say, I put a lot of work into this. I love doing it. This is what I'm here to do. But if you wanted to reciprocate some of that energy, I'll give you twice as much of a podcast. It's a great deal. So think about it. You can find the link to sign up for Plus at the show notes or on my website. Like I said, Interverse, just search that on Patreon and you'll be good. But this time on the Plus Extension, we talked about flexible and eclectic are your Vedic advice about eating and different types of food with some specific knowledge given there. Interesting stuff. Ayurvedic herb lore and medicinal supplements came up as a topic. The incorrect assumptions of the consumerism culture and Western medicine when it comes to ingesting herbs and using medicines. Shunya's activism to reduce the environmental impact of the overharvesting of herbs, which is something I never really thought about. Just one more uh, one more way that humans are greedily over consuming things on the planet. And she gave amazing tips on healing herbs you can grow yourself, which is a good solution to the over harvesting environmental impact thing. Grow it yourself. Definitely a good idea. And we talked about the deep Vedic view on deity, the true higher self and elevating past rigid religion. And we talked about synchronicity as a clue that you're ready to wake up from the dream of samsara with some good examples of that. And we discussed mind-altering plant medicines in the yogic traditions. And that's just like a taste of what we actually got into. Obviously, eight sentences doesn't cover a whole hour of conversation. So if you think you want more, you should get it. And I'd be very grateful. Thank you so much to all the Plus members that we've already got. And this is it. I think that's all I've got for today to talk about. I'm just really ready to get this one out there because it was so awesome. So thanks for listening, everybody. And also in the show notes, check out the link to the music I'm playing for the outro today, which is from the Shots Fired LP by Lucid. You guys been on the show before. I've played his music on the show before. Check him out. Soundcloud.com. Search for Lucid, L-U-S-I-D. He makes so much music. It's ridiculous. I think this is like the fifth long release of music in the last 12 months probably more than that i don't know he's all over it but definitely check out lucid thanks so much everybody for tuning in much love to everyone and get ready for some more excellent episodes coming in february i'm really excited about the direction the show's going but also really pleasantly surprised with this episode because it was one i didn't know was coming until about when it happened so (laughs) Thank you so much, Shunya, for giving me the chance to talk to you for two hours and can't wait to do it again. Thanks to everybody for being here and I'll talk to you all later.